Good afternoon, good morning, whatever you might be watching this. Thank you for inviting me to speak to iLead USA today. It's a pleasure to be able to do this. It's an even bigger pleasure to be able to do this ahead of time so that we can avoid any of the technical glitches we've been having. But uh, it's uh, really an honor to be part of the iLead USA program. I've enjoyed working with it. I've enjoyed working with my friends at the State Library of Ohio, and I really have to give them all a shout out. I want to start with Beverly Kane, our state librarian, and also thank the people who've uh, been in all of the programs and worked really closely with it. Ashley Tomini, Matthew Dyer, who is known locally as the irrepressible Matthew Dyer, uh, Missy Lodge, Evan Struble, and Mandy Knapp. It's been great working with all of these guys. Also a shout out to Illinois, without whom this never would have happened. The uh, State Library in Illinois has done a great job in organizing this. And, and making it realistic for the rest of us. So thank you all. There's one other person I need to thank before I get started, and that's Joan Fry Williams. She and I put this program together originally for the Illinois Library Association in uh, 2011, and we've done a subsequent version of it as an Info People webinar. Now, there's been a lot of changes in it. Uh, I did some rearranging and things on this, but without Joan, the original idea never would have happened. So thank you very much if you ever get a chance to see this, Joan. So, why would I be talking about hope in a hopeful workplace? Well, I love the poem by Emily Dickinson, number 254. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. On the other hand, I never would have heard of that poem if it hadn't been for Woody Allen. How wrong Emily Dickinson was. Hope is not the thing with feathers. The thing with feathers has turned out to be my nephew. I must take him to a specialist in Zurich. <laughs> Anyway, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because those two things sort of set up the fact that it's easy to understand why a hopeful workplace sometimes seems like a contradiction in terms today. You know, budgets are tight, staffs are stretched thin, everywhere people are asking us why we still need libraries when there's Google and Amazon and all the other things, whatever new bright shiny thing has come along. So before we start talking about why and how a library workplace can be called hopeful, we should start by being really clear about what a hopeful workplace is not. First, hope is not wishing. You know, despite the song, wishing and hoping are not equivalent. Ignoring reality by acting like the three monkeys, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, that's not hope. Um, you're hoping for five o'clock, hoping for the weekend, hoping for vacation, hoping for retirement, your own or someone else's. <laughs> no, 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 and no. <laughs> Hope is also not mindless, unthinking optimism. Although conscious optimism, as I'll discuss later, is a choice that characterizes a hopeful workplace. It's not the same thing as just being like Annie, you know, and the sun will come up tomorrow. Uh, no, not really. That's not really hope. Uh, you might remember a number of years ago a Peanuts cartoon where Charlie Brown is talking to Linus about why he carries a blanket. Charlie Brown asks, what if everybody was like you? What if we all ran away from our problems? What if we all just suddenly decided to run away from our problems? And Linus replies, well, at least we'd all be running in the same direction. <laughs> nice try, Linus, but uh, pretending your problems and issues aren't real or whistling past graveyards is not hope. And taking on everyone else's troubles in a misguided attempt to spare them or to make yourself feel more indispensable, that's not hope, that's masochism. Okay, so now that we've gone through all the things that aren't hope, what are we talking about? Simply put, hope is a choice. It's a choice to build rather than to destroy, to support rather than to undermine, to laugh rather than to accuse, to look for reasons to move forward rather than to retreat. Basically, hope is a belief in a higher purpose in what you're doing. Nothing signifies hope to me more than an old person who plants a tree knowing that will eventually shade his grandchildren long after he or she has left the planet. Hope is the unshakable belief that what you're doing matters, not just for the monthly or the annual report, not just for today, but for the long haul. In other words, it's not just cataloging a book, it's creating access to something that's going to help a student write a thesis or fix her car. It's not just a reference transaction, it's a moment in time that gives a person another option. It's not just fixing the damn printer again. It's making sure that someone has a decent resume to take to an interview and, embar and embark on a better life. And it's not just story time, it's a way to make a child become a lifelong reader. 
You know, a few years ago, we had a consultant here at OCLC, a, a professor of business from the Ohio State University's Fisher, Fisher School, a guy by the name of Jay Barney. And Jay, before he'd come to work with us, had been a consultant for the Mitsubishi Company in Japan. And he was there for his first get acquainted visit in Japan. And he had some people from PR and corporate planning and all those who were kind of his handlers while he was there. And they were accompanying him everywhere. And he started at a board of directors meetings. And he said to them, what's the purpose of the board of directors? And they said, the purpose of the board of directors is to ensure that we have capital enough so that we can make the best cars that money can buy. Great. So he gets down, he meets with the level of the vice presidents and the senior managers. He says, and what's your job? And they say, well, our job is to make sure that the, the workers in our company have the tools and the resources they need so that they can make the best cars money can buy. So Jay starts saying, OK, this is the kind of the company mantra. It's just what everybody says. So he goes through, and a number of times people use that exact phrase, that we're going to make the best cars money can buy. Well, finally, the, and the handlers were with him the whole time. So he figured, they've got to say this, or else these guys are going to go back to the managers. <laughs> so at one point, he was actually left alone. And he was standing on the shop floor, and a janitor walked by. And he said to the janitor, what's your job? He said, my job is to make sure that the shop floor is clean so that we can make the best cars <laughs> money can buy. Wow. OK? Now, you might be thinking, that's great. That's a really good way of, of, of making sure everybody knows it. Maybe that works for uh, individuals. But maybe it won't work for an institution. Maybe there's no way you can characterize this on an institutional basis. But I disagree. I think there are really certain characteristics of a hopeful workplace, and everyone can contribute to those characteristics, whether your role is director or trustee or shelver or porter, whatever. Now, here's the list of what I think are the key characteristics. And there's six of them. You don't have to write them down, because I'm going to go through them one by one anyway. So here they are. The first one is meaningful goals. The second one is the will to get to those goals. The third is the way to get to those goals. The fourth is having some level of control. The fifth is a reasonable expectation of success. And the sixth is a connection to others. So let's go through them one by one. The first thing is goals. You have to have meaningful goals. They need to be tied, intric <laughs> they need to be tied closely <laughs> to the higher purpose that you already have. So there's, there's some ways of, of, of understanding if they are. The first thing you ask yourself is, why are we doing this? What's the purpose of doing this in the first place? The second thing is, what difference will it make if I do it or if I don't do it? And the third is, who really cares? Who's going to be affected by this? A few years ago, uh, I was doing some consulting, and I was in a small city. And uh, well, actually, it was a pretty good-sized city, now that I think about it. And I was sitting there with Joan and, and two young adult services managers from two branches of this library system. And we were talking about what they do with their day and how they work. And one of them said to me, uh, yeah, well, and we have to do one program a week. And the other one said, oh, yeah, I hate doing those programs. And the, <laughs> the first person said, yeah, we're putting on programs that are so boring that if I wasn't paid to be there, I wouldn't be there. <laughs> so we, we went back and we talked to the, the director of this library, without naming any names, of course. Uh, and we, we told her the story. And she said, oh my god. I said, <laughs> she said, this is what happened. We put into our strategic plan that we wanted to do more programming so that we could get a better sense of what the community cared about. And the way that got translated all the way down the line was you got a checklist, you got to do one program a week. Doesn't matter if it's good, bad, or indifferent, whether anybody shows up for it, whether it's tied to anything the community cares about or not, you have to do one program a week. Those aren't meaningful goals. Those are checklists. Those are like taking your grocery list to the store. They have nothing to do with, with the, the purpose of why you're there. In order to tie into the higher purpose, the goal should look beyond the institutional and parochial tunnel vision of the library. The best goals are rooted in the community. What does the community care about? What does the community build its hopes around? What are its great fears? And then how can the library support those hopes, allay those fears, or share their concerns? Then and only then do you apply the library skills that we've all grown and developed over the years to, to those issues to create, some, to create the goals. Uh, on that same trip, I was visiting with another library in a much smaller city. And we had a, a group of friends of the library and some trustees from the library and some leading citizens in the community and the library team there. 
And we said, well, tell, tell us about your community. Well, you know, what, what do people care about? Why do people live here? And I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> And finally, somebody just spoke up and said, people live in this community until they can afford to live somewhere better. And somebody said, oh, that's a hell of a thing to try to build a library on. And we said, no, you were just handed the keys to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. If that's true, then you know what your library has to do. You've got to help people be ready to move somewhere better. And that might mean English as a second language. That might mean uh, GED training. That might mean uh, literacy skills. That might mean uh, armed forces services tests. It might mean having programming around how to get stretch your dollar. It might mean all of these different things. But if that's true, you suddenly know exactly what your community needs. And you can lay all those library skills you've built up over 10, 15, 20 years on top of those issues and that's how you do your planning. That's how you develop meaningful goals for your own community. And then once you do that, you have to be really clear about what you're trying to achieve. You have to, but even more than being clear about what you're trying to achieve, you need to be clear about why it's important. Uh, a few years ago, I spoke to a guy named Anthony Brewerton. In fact, I brought him here to OCLC. I was so impressed with him, I brought him here to talk. And he was then at Oxford Brookes University. He's not the University of Warwick in the, in the United Kingdom. But Oxford Brookes is the smaller university in that town in England where that bigger Oxford University is. <laughs> and Oxford Brookes is basically a teaching school. It's a liberal arts college. It's got some science programs and things. But it's not the research institution that its, uh, uh, its famous cousin is. So they brought in Anthony Brewerton, who was then a public librarian, which is, number one, really w weird in lots of places for a, a, an academic librarian to hire a public library but was even weirder was they brought him in to run their marketing program because this library had just languished it wasn't being used the faculty didn't care about it it just was not a popular place for this the students or the faculty to go and they were really kind of having some issues about just relevance and everything so Anthony, Anthony took or Anthony took a look at this and said okay what can I do that's actually important to the students here and he said, well, I couldn't provide them with free sex and beer. <laughs> but he said, I, what, what we could do was save time and get better grades. Mm -hmm. So that became the tagline for the library, save time, get better grades. That was a real easy way to explain to students why you have a library. Come see us, you'll save time, you'll get better grades. And it's really easy to remember. You don't need you know, a plaque on the wall that's 42 pages of small type about what your, uh, your, your mission statement is. And what was really interesting was as they started using this around the campus, their use went up. More students started coming in. The faculty started paying more attention. But what was really even more interesting was the staff started thinking about what they were doing differently. Because if what they were doing didn't help the students save time or bet, get better grades, why were they doing it? That kind of clarity, that kind of understanding why your goals are important is a key to creating a hopeful workplace. Okay, the second step that I was talking about, the second characteristic is that an institution that has a will to achieve its goals, to those, achieve those meaningful goals. And meaningful goals help to motivate people. And that motivation provides your will to get there. So to nurture and grow the motivation, people need to see themselves in whatever goals are being formulated. Uh, keep this question in mind when you're thinking about this. What's in it for me? This is a question that will always come up when you're working on an idea, a plan, some new goals. And helping people to understand where they fit into the future is a good way to en engender hope. And not coincidentally, it's also a good way to get them in a more amenable frame of mind for whatever kind of changes you're suggesting. But that's a different program for a different time. Uh, you know, Mike Royko, the great Chicago columnist, used to use, say that the motto of the city of Chicago should be, what's in it for me? And he meant it in a very cynical way, that everybody's got their hand out, they all want their share, their, their taste of whatever's going on. But I think it's also, from another point of view, a really important question to answer. If I don't know why what I'm doing fits into the bigger plan, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't give me any, it doesn't give me any motivation to be part of that. And if it actually looks like it's a, a plan that's going to do away with me, it's even harder to get my support for it. So helping, and that's what people will think of first. Because whenever, you know, in a vacuum, people go to the worst possible interpretation. So the more that you can do to shape the positive interpretation, the more you're helping towards a, a hopeful workplace. So when you're talking about the will to get there, 
uh, and it may sound like a strange dichotomy, but you need to be both brave and disciplined. You need to be brave enough to try new options, to try new roads and new experiences. You need to be willing to put yourself on the line to try these new things with an open mind and heart. And you have to take the chance of being wrong or maybe even of appearing foolish. But at the same time, you also have to be disciplined enough to select the moments to be brave. You have to be careful to make sure that your bravery is rooted in your community and what's needed there. Now here's an example of what I mean. And it's not always the big things. It's not always, you know, give me liberty or give me death. Let's take a much more basic example. How many of you work for people, or no show of hands here, maybe people yourselves, who will go off to a conference, hear a really great persuasive speaker, and then come back and try to overhaul everything at once based on what they'd heard? Now, that speaker may or may not have had a dynamite idea. They may really have, heaven by the tail. But is it a dynamite idea for your community, or for your campus, or for your organization? I mean, 3D printing seems to be the latest public library got to have, right? And in many places, it's absolutely the right thing to do. But not everywhere. Not every time. You have to balance your courage with your conscientiousness. But once you've picked your points, dare to commit. Both bravery and discipline require commitment. Making a commitment ex inspires and energizes the people who see that commitment in action. And there's a corollary to this. There's also a lot of bravery shown by the second person in. By the person who says, you know, I may not exactly know where this wackadoodle's going with this idea, but I'm ready to put my tail on the line too. Uh, you, you all know the difference between a good friend and a great friend? A good friend will bail you out of jail. A great friend will be sitting next to you on the bench saying, damn, that was fun. <laughs> There's the commitment. So once the hopeful workplace has its meaningful goals and the energy and the will to get there, what's next? Well, you need to have the way to get there. One could say where there's a will, there's a way, but that would be such a bad pun, even I wouldn't do it. And, and seriously, just having the will isn't enough. You have to have, clearly have a way to get there. Uh, you just can't count on it to sprout up organically. You, you really have to be explicit and clear about this just the way you are about the goals themselves. So, how do you determine the best way to get to your goals in a hopeful way? I would start with appreciative inquiry. Now, if you're not familiar with this concept, this is something that Maureen Sullivan, who's a former president of the American Library Association, kind of, she crossed the neutral zone between business world and library world with this idea, which had been knocking around the business world for, for a few years. But basically, the idea of appreciative inquiry is that you build on your strengths instead of trying to always constantly uh, fix your weaknesses. So it starts with three questions, which may vary depending on the practitioner, but they're pretty similar no matter who's doing this. And the first question is, what do we have to work with? What resources do we have at hand? Not what could we use a little more of, not what, oh, if I only had, but what resources do we have to work with? Then, what are we really good at? What can we do better? What can we do better than most people can? What, what, what resources in terms of ideas and thoughts and, and people do we have that we're really good at? And then, what is uniquely ours? What do we do that nobody else does? You can find a lot of ways to implement this concept on Google, both in libraries and from the original business concept. But the idea, basically, is to get away from that hope-destroying culture of scarcity we live in. You know how that works. Oh, if I only had a couple more staff, or if I only had a few more dollars, or if I only had a different setup for my friends in the library group, or if only the university gave me a more understanding provost, or if we had a better principal. That stuff all destroys hope. And it's not building on the strengths. I just can't stress this enough. Consistently focusing on what you can't do and what you don't have will sap the hope out of you and everyone around you faster than Eeyore can say, oh well. <laughs> Building on your strengths is so much more hopeful than always trying to remediate your weaknesses. You know, I, if that weren't true, I'd be, a, I'd be 60 pounds lighter. <laughs> I just buy bigger clothes. <laughs> okay? Every library has strengths. Every library. You know, it, it, we have people, we have good people, smart people who do really good work. We have facilities. Now, think of how rare that is in a lot of ways. Most communities don't have facilities that are open to everybody. 
We got engraved in the, on the doorway for many of our libraries, open to all, free to all, whatever. Uh, when you think about how locked down schools are, how malls don't allow kind of public debate that we, we have in our libraries, when you think about how churches have become battlegrounds in some places, those facilities are really important strengths. We have collections. We have good stuff, lots of stuff. Maybe not as much of it, maybe not as current as we want, but that's not what we're talking about here. We have good stuff. Uh, and people know how, who know how to use it. Frequently we have locations. How many university libraries are right at the heart of their campus? How many public libraries are right at the main crossroads of whatever town or city that they're located in? Uh, and frequently there's even parking. Maybe that's more for the suburban libraries than the city ones, but that's, even that's a possibility. We've got skills. Uh, important skills, important skills in an information area. And these are all things that we bring to the table that most other players in any community don't have. Those are strengths we can build on. Building on your strengths allows you to focus on the results you're trying to achieve rather than the process you need to get there, okay? But the results and I suggest that you focus on are not your results, but rather the results that your users get by taking advantage of your services. If I have a leaky pipe in the basement, and I go to Craigslist or I go to the, uh, the Yellow Pages or wherever I go to try to find a plumber, the plumbers don't advertise, we have 42 wrenches and three people on truck at all times. <laughs> they say, we fix leaks fast 24-7. I don't care how many wrenches they have. I don't care how many people they have on duty or on call or whatever. I want to know how, if I use their services, I'm going to be better. And that's focusing on the, the results of the people you're trying to reach rather than always trying to hit numbers or do the, the metrics that your, your institution has. You want to start with how you want them to end up. You know, if you're doing a summer reading program, you want your kids to go back to school with almost as many brain cells as they left it with in the previous uh, spring. If you're working with students, you do want them to try to get out in less than seven years uh, in college. You know, <laughs> you, you want your corporation to, to be better because the, the corporate library is there. So start with the results you're trying to get and focus on the strengths that you can bring to make that happen. And then every once in a while, it's not going to work. One of the hard realities is that not everything works out the way we hoped they would. Some results just don't turn out like we thought. So how do you keep hope alive? Sorry, President Obama. Uh, how do you keep hope alive when things go wrong? First thing to do, avoid the blame game. It doesn't help to find scapegoats. Uh, that sets a really bad precedent for everyone else. And it's another very serious hope killer. <coughs> Next, avoid the temptation to say, I will never, ever try that again. Instead, if you want to keep hope alive, the idea is to approach it by saying, what can we learn from this? Mm -hmm. If we do this again, maybe we don't want to do it on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> if we do this, when we do this again, we may not want to do it uh, on the night that the kids are out trick-or-treating. How, how can we do it better? How can we do it differently? Not, I'll never try that one again. Maybe one of the things you can learn is that it's better to fail fast and carry on. I found a really good example of this from a blog I just happened to be reading a couple of days ago. And uh, somebody wrote, inspiration has blessed you with an idea, say tofu flavored ice cream. But you don't yet realize that the idea sucks and it just won't work. Is it better to spend hours of time and gobs of money trying to perfect your bad idea that you still don't realize is bad I mean, tofu ice cream, yuck! Mm -hmm. Or does it make more sense to get it implemented quickly, uh, quickly enough to give it a reality check in the real world? In our library world, we try to make everything perfect. And we hate to think that anything we've undertaken may not work, or may not work forever. So we don't want to let, a, so we don't want to let it go. We intermingle the personal and the professional, and the ideas that don't work become personal failings rather than experiments or things whose time has passed. But if we keep beating that poor dead horse, the energy and the hope will evaporate really quickly. All right, step number four, characteristic number four um, in, to create a hopeful workplace is ensuring that everyone has some level of control within the workplace. Now this is a tough one for librarians. Uh, we want everything to be perfect and allowing someone else to be in charge of even the smallest details can sometimes be anathema. Relinquishing control for us is as distasteful as eating that tofu flavored ice cream. <laughs> now, some level of control does not mean anarchy. 
It does mean that you have your goals in sight, and you've got the will and the way to get there, and then you give people the authority to do the work. Everyone needs to understand their roles. You, your colleagues, the people who report to you, the people to whom you report. If you don't see what your role in the big picture is, it's very easy to get bogged down in the minutia and lose that trail of hope. To understand your role, you need to work within an environment where communications are open and honest. Uh, and by the way, it's one thing to be able to speak your mind. It's another thing to know that you'll be heard when you speak. And I'm just saying heard. I'm not saying followed. I'm not saying everything you say is going to be implemented instantly. But just knowing that you're going to get a fair hearing is part of having an, a hopeful workplace. Um, John Fry Williams often notes that librarianship can tend to be a one right answer culture. We talk about answering reference questions or authority control or master records. This can lead to some inflexibility and, and it can lead us to miss some opportunities. The first time I saw a Rubik's Cube, somebody mixed it up and handed it to me. I said, what? They said, the idea is to get the same color on all six sides. So I looked at it, I played with it for a minute, and then I slowly and methodically peeled off all the labels <laughs> put, and then put them back with the right colors on all six sides. And they said, that's not the way you do it. I said, you told me I needed all six colors on each one on one side. What did I do wrong? You didn't do this. I said, I didn't have to do this. <laughs> okay, but, but smacking someone down just because they didn't do the job your way or living in fear that you'll get in hot water for taking a different route, either one of those is symptomatic of an unhopeful workplace. Finding those alternate ways to succeed and knowing that you won't catch hell for doing it is a sign of a hopeful workplace. I mean, who doesn't enjoy getting away with something once in a while? And having a couple of co-conspirators within your institution makes it even sweeter, right? <laughs> what, what I'm getting at is this. Sometimes hope has to sneak in the back door. And sometimes that works because you've applied stealth, guile, and disobedience to the work in front of you. As I said, this can be incredibly fun. And once it happens, it's important to do recognition. It really is important. Um, I, I used to work with two people, both of whom have since retired here at OCLC. And one of them was somebody who always wanted to be recognized. He, you know, you could not give this person enough praise. He wanted everybody to know just how sensational he was and all the work that he had done and everything he brought. And so people gave it to him and he kept doing good work. And then he had an assistant who, if you even mentioned her, the way I mentioned the people who worked at the State Library on this project, just in passing to thank her for something, she would be incredibly embarrassed. She wanted to really work in the shadow. She didn't like that kind of public recognition at all. One on one, I could take her aside and tell her, that was a great job you did on that project. And she was fine. But public recognition was absolutely distressing to her. It's important to recognize people in the way they want and need to be recognized. And who you recognize is also really important. You need to honor the right people, the ones who are truly responsible for success, because then you energize that team and you encourage others who see that to try a little harder. You also can fall into the trap of recognizing the wrong people uh, or, or the wrong team. And what happens when you do that is, first you demotivate the people who actually did the work. It's like, why should I bother if they don't even see what I'm doing? And then everybody else, those same people who would be motivated if you saw somebody right getting praised, will say, what about these guys? They're the ones who actually did the work. So you want to make sure that you aim it right and that you get it right. I, when um, I was the director of the Fairfield County Library here in Ohio uh, a long, long time ago, uh, we had uh, more rules, more rules than the most restrictive religion you've ever heard of. It was not unlike a cult. And um, <laughs> so I, when I got a, a little while after I got there, I said, "Let's have a contest, and let's." get rid of the dumbest rule we can find. Just start with one. And I said, well, what's the most Mickey Mouse rule we have? And I said, the person who identifies that and finds a way out of it will win a prize. And the prize they won was a Mickey Mouse watch. <laughs> yeah, it was excellent too. And it was just exactly what that person wanted. About 10 years later, I ran into him in a bar. And he pulled his hand up and he was still wearing the Mickey Mouse watch. <laughs> so I think that was one that worked. OK. so. The number five characteristic of a, a hopeful workplace is to have a reasonable expectation of success. Now, every word in that is important. Reasonable means it's not guaranteed. 
Nobody's saying this is a, a, a lock for you to get, for this to be successful. But there's, it can't be so pie in the sky. Here's one of the things that kills hope, okay? You have a mission statement that says, the Thunderbolt Public Library will be the premier source of information in Thunderbolt County. Really? You've never heard of the internet in Thunderbolt County? You've never heard of Google? You've never heard of Amazon? Setting a goal that's so high, that's so unreasonable, that's so pie in the sky, is a really good way to destroy hope. You want to have an expectation of success. You want to build a sense of that, that we can do this. We can work together and make this happen. And you have to have clarity and agreement on what constitutes success. You know, if we increase the number of card holders or card users in our area by X percent, is that success? And if so, why? And then how are we going to get there? And there's some ways to make this realistic. I, I love using analogies and examples to provide a way to achieve clarity. So you could say, like, our self-check machines, well, they're sort of like an ATM, but for library stuff. A LAN party, it's sort of like a summer reading program party, but it's for teenagers instead. Uh, another good way is to use examples of people who have tried something similar and survived. Uh, but but you, there, there's a downside to that, though. And that's that if we're always looking for trailblazers, we're not busting any new trails ourselves. As a consultant, what used to drive me nuts is I would go to a, an opening meeting with a library director, maybe their top managers, and, and they'd say, we want to try something really new. We, we, we just were sick of the old box. We want to try something really, really sensationally new, get us written up in American libraries or whatever. So you go back to the room, you'd brainstorm, you'd work, you'd work all night, you'd come up with an idea, you'd bring it in, you'd present it, and they'd say, now can you tell us four or five other libraries that have tried this so we can see what they did? It's like, no, because we just came up with this last night. <laughs> so no, un unless somebody's really like gone back in time, it isn't going to happen that way. So um, one good way of, of being able to measure that is to have people who've come through similar processes and survived and having those kinds of mentors. And sometimes they know they're your mentor and sometimes they don't. I always consider Charlie Robinson a real mentor even though I didn't meet him until I, long after I was running public libraries because of what he'd written and what he'd said. When I finally got a chance to meet him and tell him that, it was really important. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny because Fred Kilgore is still a mentor at OCLC, even though he's been, he's been dead for six years. We still go back to his writings and go back to the, some of the things he said. And though, the, having that kind of a, a tradition really helps uh, with, with creating hope. There's one other thing I want to say in this reasonable expectation of successes, and that is you need to have equal time for upside surprises, too. Not all surprises are bad. Sometimes you get a bequest that you weren't expecting. Sometimes you get a nice letter to the editor in the newspaper, or uh, you get a nice post on Facebook. If you're going to play the what if game, make sure you give equal time to positive possibilities as well as the negative ones. We are so good at predicting disaster. Much better at predicting disaster than we are at leveraging success. We plan for how we're going to mitigate the problems, how we're going to assuage the hurt feelings, how we're going to recover. But in the words of Paul Simon, when something goes right, oh, it's likely to lose me. It's apt to confuse me because it's such an unusual sight. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, the, the, the last, and I think in many ways, the most important characteristic of a hopeful workplace is to have connections to other people. Hopeful workplaces are not only connected to results and to ideas, they're connected to other people. I love the, what, the Topeka Shawnee County Library in Kansas has a couple of mottos. The one I especially love is, we do nothing alone. They work in cooperative ways throughout the county when they're doing a new idea or a new plan. Knowing that you're rooted in and connected to the community you support, whether that community is a campus or a school building or a, a political subdivision, a corporation, a, a government entity, it's, it's a source of camaraderie, a sense that we're all in this together. Hopeful workplaces engender relationships, not just transactions. Now, now don't get me wrong, transactions are vital. We want people to hit our website. We want people to check out the books, the videos, the music, to attend events. And sometimes all your client really wants to do is grab the materials and run. But if that's all we're doing with our clients, we're missing an opportunity to do something that's much deeper and more meaningful. Transactions by their very nature are transient. They happen and they're over. They're fungible. It doesn't matter who does them or really within reasonable parameters how well they do them. But by contrast, relationships endure over time. 
Relationships are built on a level of trust and mutual support, of respect. Relationships are harder to leave behind, or to put it another way, they're harder to starve for funding. I want to say spe something specifically to people here who are in management or leadership positions in your institution. It's really easy to begin to feel isolated, to feel like you're, you're carrying the burden for everyone. This can be acutely painful, and it can even lead to a real sense of hopelessness. But it doesn't have to be that way. It's only lonely at the top if you let it be. It's only lonely at the top if you let it be. Uh, it, it, it's even more important when you're in a position of leadership or authority to have a network of people you trust. People with whom you can share your burden, people uh, with whom you can be honest and open. They don't need to be librarians. I mean, optometrists and school principals and auto mechanics and postal workers need to let off steam too, and they need to share their burdens. Having somebody you can talk to and be honest with is really important. They don't need to work in your library, and in fact, it's probably better if they don't. That will help uh, 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 keep away from any fears of information leakage in these things. But it really is, it's a self-imposed exile if you let it be. Having that core of people that you can work with is really vital. As a public library director in Ohio, we had a group we called ETM. Every three months, we got together. That's ETM. We didn't tell anybody what that stood for, and I hope I haven't just violated a great secret. <laughs> If I have, so be it. It was 30 years ago. I, the statute of limitation should have, or I could take up custody in the Russian embassy, one or the other. <laughs> anyway, um, but the whole idea was we were the, the, the second tier of public libraries in the state of Ohio. There was the top 10 big cities and, and bigger districts. And then we would get together every three months as directors. No substitutes. We weren't allowed to send an assistant. It was just us and the state librarian would get together for dinner and conversation. And we would compare notes on what was working and what wasn't. And we would share ideas. We would go into a, a, the director's library and make suggestions about layout and things like that just as a, as, a, as a group. And it meant so much to know that I had, working in Lancaster, there was no other public library director I could talk to. But I knew I could call the director in Newark, or I could call the director up in Shaker Heights, or wherever, and have a conversation where I was talking to somebody who knew what I was up against. And she knew she could call me, too. And it was a very useful thing. I would recommend that highly. So at this point, I'd like to talk about some of the choices we have to make. Christopher Reeve once said, once you choose hope, anything is possible. And I said at the very outset that hope was a choice. And the essence of hope is choice, a belief that we don't live in a predetermined, or even worse, a hostile universe. So given that we can make choices, I'm going to, make, I'm going to suggest some choices you can make to help create a hopeful workplace. First, I would suggest that you choose optimism. And again, this isn't just blindly thinking Pollyanna-ish thoughts about how the sun will come up tomorrow. This is actually looking for ways you can find the better side of what's happening. I have a good friend, somebody I've known for years, who whenever something happens, good, bad, or indifferent, she's always looking for the hidden causes. What do they really mean when they say they like this program? Does that mean they didn't like this other program? Uh, you know, who are they trying to make contact with? And I, I keep telling this person, this is not a good way to live. <laughs> this is, this, um, herein lies madness, because eventually you end up listening to those radio shows. And you really don't want to end up like that. Uh, another thing is you want to choose civility. No one should be allowed to get away with being rude. It doesn't kill any of us to say, please, thank you, good morning, good evening. Civility is a social lubricant that allows people to interact easily. I know of a leader of a large uh, institution who is long since retired, but the rule in that place was you couldn't make eye contact with him unless he made eye contact first. You couldn't speak to him first. He had to address you. If he was coming down the hallway, you, you just couldn't make small talk with this person. To me, that's nothing but being a bully. That, and by the same token, we shouldn't be allowed to do that with our public either. If you have the choice, choose generosity. Being, genero being generous with your experience, with your advice when it's sought, with your time, that's the mark of a hopeful individual. Also, we need to be generous with each other in the profession. That one right answer culture I alluded to earlier can sometimes make us sort of churlish. Too often I've seen librarians hone in on a colleague's mistake, like a heat-seeking missile closing in on a target. We need to show generosity and even forgiveness as we strive to do the best we can for our communities. Choose flexibility. 
One of the easiest ways to flummox people who still subscribe to the old stereotypes of librarians is to be flexible. <laughs> they won't know what to make of it. Mm -hmm. When we realize that the role of the library is to make it easier to get to information as opposed to protecting the collection from the barbarians, mm -hmm. the easier it is to be flexible. And an organization that's willing to cut people some slack is a hopeful organization, not only for the workers, but also for the users. Now this goes back to choosing generosity, because after all, being flexible is one way of being generous. Whenever possible, choose teamwork. The era of the Lone Ranger is over. After all, even Johnny Depp couldn't sell a Lone Ranger movie in 2013. <laughs> Jay Jordan was fond of quoting an African proverb, to go fast, go alone, to go far, go together. Successful teamwork, where everyone has a designated role and a stake in the outcome, where teammates are valued and respected, builds hope like nothing else. Choose laughter. If it ain't fun, you gotta make it fun. I, I have a simple rule of thumb about my work. When I lose my sense of humor about a job, I start looking for another job. Laughter breaks up the tension, it gives people a respite, and it helps build goodwill. Um, a well-timed joke, a, a sight gag, an inside joke, the things that kind of tie, bring us together, all of these build up the teamwork that you want, and it helps lead to more hope, which creates sort of a virtuous circle. You want to choose gratitude. Understanding that no one makes it alone, that we all need other people, and acknowledging what we owe to others is both humbling and hopeful. We should choose respect. We're all in this madhouse earth together, right? So respecting the rights, the history, and the experience of others is vital. People know when you don't respect them, and they avoid you as a result. Nobody wants to be dissed. I remember a couple of years ago, my wife and I had two teenage boys staying with us as part of an exchange program. One was from France, and one was from Spain. And they wanted to go shopping, so we took them over to the Abercrombie store. And they went in there, and they, they took to it like, you know, spaniels to water and I felt like everybody in that store was watching me I was in there for about 30 seconds <laughs> and when I realized that all they wanted from me was my credit card and so I didn't stay very long but you know you get that feeling when you know you're not being respected the last choice I'm going to suggest is that you choose to take care of yourself you can't be hopeful if you're ignoring your physical self your body is not just a vehicle for conveying your brain around you know Take the time to relax, to get away from the craziness. Um, if, you're, if you're putting in an unending string of 12-hour days with no holidays, no weekends, no vacations, not only is your work going to suffer, so is your attitude, and so is your spirit. Finally, in order to be hopeful, you need to be in touch with what you believe. A few years ago, NPR brought back a series that Edward R. Murrow used to do during the 1950s called This I Believe. And the idea was that they invited people, some famous, some just people off the street, to write their own statements of what they believe. And it could have been about their jobs, it could have been about their family, it could be about their religion, it could be about history, whatever. A few years ago, when I first started consulting, um, I was working with a library and the director and the deputy director had worked together for a couple of years. They, they worked together all right, but there was something missing. And so this was just about the time NPR was doing this. So Joan and I suggested to them that they write this I believe statements. And we agreed to do it at the same time so that we could kind of compare notes. And what was really interesting was when they sat down and read them, they realized where the missing link was between them because the director had one set of motivations and why she was doing what she did that the deputy director had never seen because she never talked about them straight out. Once she made those real, they could understand each other much better. And the, and the work did a hockey stick. It just took off. Mm -hmm. their, their, their library has just been incredible since then. I would invite anybody to take a look at the old NPR website that has the, the statements and, and try this. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be anything you'd ever share with anybody. But if you do it, and you, and you have somebody that you're having, you, you're just not working right with. I wouldn't suggest doing this if you're actually at, at friction with somebody. But when you think there's just something, you could, you could take it to the next level and you're not, try this. And then sit down and compare notes. I think you'll find that it's really, really effective in learning how to work together better. It, once you understand where somebody's coming from, and frankly, once you understand yourself where you're coming from better, it's a lot easier to be hopeful. 
I open this program with a poem by Emily Dickinson. So let me close with another 19th century poem. This is Work Without Hope, written by, in 1825 by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Work without hope draws nectar in a sieve, and hope without an object cannot live. So I would suggest know what your higher purpose is, know why your work counts, know what you believe, and then make the choices that will help you get to that object. If you do this consistently, you will have built a hopeful workplace. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, good luck with the rest of the iLead program.